So tonight, Al is going to talk to us about scripting Excel with Python. So I think we have probably a lot of non-traditional Python folks in the room. At least I hope we do. Who here is not, wouldn't consider themselves a Python person, but more of an Excel person? Yeah, so we've got some people in the room who've come just for this talk. That's awesome. So Al, I'll let you take it away. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. OK. So uh, it's wow, it's great to talk. Um, a little bit about myself. I wrote a book, uh, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. So back in about 2012, I'm not sure if other people uh, have a similar memory, but I, I'd say it was around 2012 when Learn to Code became this huge uh, meme of sorts and everybody was sort of like getting really excited about Code Academy and everybody was sort of thinking, oh, I should learn how to code and learn how to program. And, um, you know, it was this exciting new skill that everybody should get, like everybody should learn how to program. And so I sort of thought, well, why exactly? I mean, why learn to code as opposed to, I don't know, learn to speak Spanish or learn how to operate a table saw or something. Um, and, and I feel like a lot of people who aren't software developers have this sort of anxiety that they don't want to get left behind as technology changes. So learning to code is, is sort of a, a way that they could, you know, get ahead of that curve. Um, but it really sort of bothered me because it seemed to be more of a fad. Um, and especially the, the idea that everybody should learn how to code. And I was wondering how true that was. And so I thought about it and I kind of came around to the conclusion like, yeah, you know, pretty much everybody should learn how to code. Not everyone has to become a software engineer. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of crazy. You need lots of different types of people to make a world. But learning how to code is, is sort of like a generally useful skill to have. And so I sort of thought, well, what types of things should people learn how to do? And, and I kind of considered um, what would the average office worker who, or somebody who uses a computer as part of their day-to-day -day work, what type of skills would they have to learn? And so I compiled a whole bunch of this together and, and thought Python was a great language to use as a beginner's programming language, like the first language that you learn. And I wrote a book and it's called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. It's released under a Creative Commons license. Um, can everyone see my screen right now as well? Yep. Okay, so yeah, so you can read the entire book at automatetheboringstuff.com. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be going over chapter 12, which is the chapter where you're working with Excel spreadsheets. But I just sort of thought like, okay, well, you know, the types of things that office workers need to learn how to automate with their computer. And so it's just, you know, like reading and writing files and regular expressions, uh, web scraping, or just, you know, parsing a whole bunch of PDF files because... I would have a lot of friends who, who had office jobs who would say something like, you know, I spent three hours today just like opening a spreadsheet up and copying and pasting this one line into a different spreadsheet and then opening the next spreadsheet and this really like tedious, mind numbing task that if they knew how to program, they'd be able to automate it. So um, I think the, the most popular chapters in this book are the web scraping and the GUI automation and the Excel chapters. So I'm just going to go through the Excel stuff. Uh, tonight. So the I had to look through a whole bunch of different Python modules when I was compiling this book together. And the best module that I found for Excel is one called OpenPyExcel. And it has a really nice read the docs page. It's, it's pretty well maintained. It's up to date. It has a lot of, of nice features. It doesn't have every single feature uh, that you could possibly want but it has all of the big ones. And so I'm just gonna sort of lightly go through this uh, over the main features tonight and just sort of do some live coding exercises because what could possibly go wrong with live coding exercises? So the way to install um, OpenPyXL is you can just use pip. Um, so something like, you know, pip install OpenPyXL uh, is hopefully the easy way to get it installed on your machine. Uh, I think the latest version is 2.3.5, uh, I believe. But once you have it installed on your laptop, then it's really easy to get started. I'm just going to be using idle for, for all of this, just because you know it's the thing that most people probably have already installed and configured. But open PyXL. And let's see what the latest version is by 
looking at Dunder version, Dunder 2.3.4. Yeah, I think I have a slightly older version. Uh, they've made some changes in, in uh, the API, but uh, I think a lot of the times they have like nice warnings that tell you like, okay, this name has been changed to whatever. Um, yeah, so if we just here's an example spreadsheet that I have that I'm going to be using. Uh, I just have some random data, date times, strings, numbers. Um, the thing about uh, spreadsheets is that you can sort of consider this to be the same thing as like a Cartesian coordinate system with data at each of these cells. So instead of X and Y, they have columns and rows, and the columns have letters. And then, you know, at each coordinate, you can find some piece of information, some piece of data that you want to manipulate. And OpenPy Excel does a really good job of making this easy to use. I'm going to first change my working directory, uh, let's see, to my desktop. And so the, you know, there are some like weird little warts uh, in OpenPy Excel. I think the first one is that it doesn't have an open function as like the obvious name for the open function, but instead it has load workbook. And then you just pass it the file name that you want. So open, uh, let's see, Excel uh, SX. And you can see here's that workbook object, which is the name of the, the spreadsheet file itself. You can see they <laughs> got very specific here with workbook.workbook.workbook, just in case you forget what type of uh, file it is. So that represents uh, this uh, Excel file. And, you know, I never really messed around with Excel all that much. And I always just thought it was like, okay, here's the one spreadsheet. But actually, workbooks can contain multiple spreadsheets. You can see, see this in the tabs down here. And, oh, and by the way, I'm using Excel, but uh, since the file formats are the same for LibreOffice and OpenOffice, you can use those spreadsheet programs as well to, to read your files. Um, but you can see that there's you know multiple sheets inside of a single workbook. So if we want to actually grab uh, one of those sheets, we can just call the get sheet names method just to see what's in there. And by default, Excel usually puts in sheet one, sheet two, sheet three. I'm just going to grab one of those sheets uh, with get sheet by name. Now, I don't want to go too much into just, you know, do, being a reference manual of sorts and going through a laundry list of all the uh, different uh, functions that are, that are in this module, but I just want to give you sort of a general tour of what OpenPy Excel can do. Um, there we go. And look at this. This is a worksheet object. And here is where you have, you can use Python's uh, brackets uh, indexing to actually grab the values in each of these cells. So for A1, you can get see this value. It's a date time object, and so OpenPy Excel will create a date time object for that. You can look at strings. You can see that's returned as a string. And then also if you have these formatted as numbers in your spreadsheet, OpenPy Excel, you can see this is returned as an integer rather than a string of the number 73. So this is kind of nice. You can sort of conceptually think of your spreadsheet as just this Cartesian coordinate sort of two-dimensional data structure. Um, just like if you had some sort of uh, like list of list sort of object, or if you had, say, I don't know, a dictionary where the x and y coordinates were stored as as two integer tuples. It's the exact same sort of concept here. This is just, uh, your file is just a two-dimensional data uh, structure. And OpenPy Excel is, has made some pretty good choices for most of its naming concepts. Like if you wanted to update, say, this number 73 in your spreadsheet, you can just take that value and um, let's just change this to 42. And right now, this is all stored um, just in memory right now. If you want to save it to disk, you can take that original workbook object that you had and call save. And I usually save this as a different file name, just so I don't overwrite 
my original file. Um, I'm always paranoid about uh, if I write some script, it might have a bug on it, uh, uh, some bug in it that I just like run it over an entire folder of all these spreadsheets and that just completely mangles all my data. So I'm just gonna be saving this as a different file. And that's just with uh, the dot save function. So I'm just gonna go back to my desktop, open this up, and now you can see this has changed to 42. So really obvious, right? Um, let's see, there's, there's a whole bunch of other bells and whistles that Open uh, Pi Excel gives you. For example, you can take a look at the individual uh, sheets and you can see that it has a title. I can maybe change that to a new name if I wanted to. Go ahead and save that again. Example three. And now you can see down here, it's named my sheet name instead of just sheet one. And uh, yeah, so, okay, so that's a pretty obvious way to access these files, but using this, you know, sort of a string of C1 or some other name for, for the cell is kind of awkward, especially if you're gonna write a for loop and just iterate over several different values that you have. So fortunately, um, Fortunately, OpenPy Excel has some ways of making this a little bit easier. Let's see, Sheet also has a cell function where you can retrieve a specific cell. So if I wanted to grab, say, row one, column three, column three is, you know, using integers is much nicer than just using letters of the alphabet right here. That returns that exact same cell object that this does. So you can just call dot value on that and then read the value that way. This way you can have something, you know, like for range in, let's just say five. Uh, row is I, column is three. Oh, <laughs> this is, uh, knew I would at least have a few errors during any live coding demo. So, oh, another important thing that you might've been wondering about is that all of these, uh, the indexes start at one and not zero, which sort of makes sense if you're coming from the Excel world. I mean, you, right here, the row, the first row is row one, not row zero. So I'm gonna have to change this just a little bit. I'm gonna have to start at one and then go to five. And you can see it'll spit out all of those numbers right here that are the same numbers here. Well, I changed the, the first one, but you can see 85, 14, 52. Now, if you just want to find out, well, how many rows or how many columns you have in that sheet, this is stored as just a simple attribute. We can find the max row, just seven. You can see that's the very last row that has information stored to it. And max column, which is returned as an integer, which is three, so you can see uh, the C column is the latest one. And uh, switching between the, the column names with letters back to integers is sort of a pain, and you could write your own function to do it, but fortunately, uh, OpenPy Excel provides that for us. It is, let's see, openpyxl.cell dot get column letter. And then you can pass this something like the number one, and that returns a or the number 26 and that returns Z. And with Excel, if you've ever created a super big spreadsheet, uh, once you get past Z, it just adds another letter, sort of making this like a base 26 number system. Um, so 27 is just AA and then it goes on to AB, AC. And then we also have the exact, uh, the inverse of that, where if you wanted to, uh, what is it? Get the, uh, I believe it's get column index from string, if you had something like, oh no, I think it is just get column index from string. That'll do the inverse where it just takes the letters that you're providing it with and then it returns the number. Um, but really using this, I find myself most often just using this sheet.cell and then passing it the row and column numbers directly whenever I have to iterate over a whole range of different values. Um, yeah, so that's essentially all you have to, all you need to know really, if you want to treat an Excel spreadsheet as just sort of this two-dimensional data structure. 
Uh, but a lot of people like to ha use all of the really fancy options of Excel. And like, you know, people fall in love with their spreadsheets and want to make the data look nicer. They want to use better fonts or different sizing for the rows and columns. And OpenPyExcel Excel also lets you do that as well. This is really a really nice feature to have if you ever need to generate Excel spreadsheets uh, for like a daily report where you just need to create a nicely formatted spreadsheet file that has a whole bunch of numbers on it. Um, and you're generating this on a day-to-day -day basis, but you, want it, you still want it to look nice and not just uh, like a spreadsheet full of numbers. So let's go back to that workbook object. Uh, if we wanted to ever create new sheets here instead of just sheet one, sheet two, sheet three, we have our create sheet function for or the create sheet method for the workbook objects. We can give it any title, uh, you know, my sheet name, like I did before. And we can also give it uh, its position inside the workbook. So you can see sheet one is the first sheet. If I wanted my sheet name to be the new first sheet in this workbook, I could just give it an index of zero. If I wanted it to be the second one, I could just give it an index of one. And I'll go ahead and try saving this and opening that up. Oh yeah, and here's that old one that when I changed it to my sheet name, and now that I've given it a duplicate name, same as the original one, Excel will just automatically add one to its name. So you can add additional sheets to it. You can also change the sizes of these, uh, of these individual cells. I'll go back here. We just have uh, the sheet object. We'll just find its row dimensions. And we can say, oh, take the row dimensions of row one. And we can find out, oh, I guess it doesn't give us the, the height of it. But we can assign the height to be something like super tall. We can do this the same thing with the column dimensions. Let's say column two. I want to be really wide. Oh, that's an unfortunate error. Oh, right columns. Uh, in this case, we're not going to be able to use integers for, for the columns, but we'll have to use something like column B instead of column two. We can adjust the width of that. And I'll just save this. That's a really odd error. Oh. Huh, okay. Well, I knew I was playing with fire by having a live coding demo, which was of course working half an hour ago. Um, but yeah, so it is possible at least uh, to change the, the column names or the column uh, dimensions and the row dimensions as well. Just if you wanna ever space these out differently from something besides their default values. Um, and then you can also change around the, the height and width as well. Just go ahead and reload that workbook. So let's take, uh, let's see, get sheet name. Oh, get sheet by name. Let's see. Um, oh, right. And also, uh, if you ever wanted to change the font style, just give it a, a different font and with a different size, maybe bolded or underlined. Uh, if you ever want to create sort of a heading for the first row, you can take uh, like an individual uh, cell. Let me just try B1. And I can set this to a brand new font object now. Oh. Fonts have a really long name, so usually I'm just gonna do something like from OpenPy Excel uh, dot styles import font. So I can take that B1 cell and set its font 
to a brand new font. So I can just, you can see all the options right here. Just say, maybe I want to make it size 14, set bold to true, set italic to true. And then I'll save this as a new file. And so you can make adjustments to the individual fonts as well. So that's all the, the basic um, sort of data manipulation uh, mod, uh, functionality of OpenPy Excel. Uh, you can also you know, make it kind of look really nice. Uh, the main thing that people really like about Excel though is being able to create graphs easily from data. And this is where OpenPy Excel is, is really nice, but it's, it's, you know, it's still an open source project that's maintained by two people. So it does have the ability to create uh, charts from your data. Uh, have an existing spreadsheet that, has, that already has a chart loaded, it's not going to be able to read that chart in and make any adjustments to it. But again, if you have something like a daily report that you're creating, then being able to create a chart inside these, inside these uh, spreadsheets programmatically is a really nice feature to have. Um, unfortunately, it's also kind of a very lengthy setup and I always have to consult the reference materials to remember how to do all the different steps. So I'm gonna go through this. Hopefully this will work out really nicely. So we're just going to, uh, so we have our basic importing OpenPy Excel. I'm just going to get that workbook object again. Uh, or actually, or if you wanted to create a brand new workbook object, you can just call openpyxl.workbook. Oh, unless they've changed, oh, fortunately, I think in this new version, they have renamed this to workbook with a capital W. Okay, um, we'll just, create a new sheet for that. And uh, let's just populate it with some random data. Just going to import random right here, make a quick loop uh, starting from one because the, the beginning row index is one and not zero. We'll just go up to 11. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'll just have sheet uh, A, Uh, whichever, so column A, and I'll just set the value of that. Just some random data right here, something from one to 100. Okay, let me save this and just check that this is working out. Hmm. Oh, it's, it's what? Oh, yes. Let me open that up. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. There we go. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we have some random data here. I'll go back to, to idle. Uh, okay. So creating a chart that's don't ex I don't expect anyone to remember all these different steps, but I just want to quickly go through them just to show you that it is possible. First, you're going to create a series object, or no, a reference object. And this will just have uh, sort of which uh, cells in your spreadsheet that you want to create data out of. So I'm just going to go from that A1 cell down to A10. Oh, this is chart, I believe now. Oh, okay, hold on. I think I have, oh rats. Okay, I think I have uh, the wrong, I'm sorry about this. I have the wrong uh, version of OpenPy Excel 
installed and they've made a lot of adjustments in this area. Um, okay, so I'm not going to do the thing where I'm going to have the entire audience bear with me while I go through all of this, but it is possible to create bar charts or line charts using OpenPy Excel um, so that you can generate uh, charts inside these spreadsheets programmatically. Um, yeah, so again, uh, as I said before, OpenPy Excel, it's, it's the most mature uh, Python module for dealing with Excel spreadsheets that's currently out there. There were a, a few others that I found, but none of them were anywhere near uh, um, as you know, featureful as OpenPy Excel. So I really sing the praises of this project. And they can definitely use much more help. Um, uh, if you have the time, they have a Bitbucket repo that you can uh, check out. But also, um, you know, because Excel spreadsheets sort of have this, I don't know, it's a really complicated and wonderful but complicated piece of software that has a lot of different features. And so a lot of you might think that working on a module that could deal with something so complex, but really it's uh, not quite that bad. And I mean, if you take any of these Excel, uh, I don't know if you know this, but if you take any Excel file and just change it uh, to .zip, all of these Excel files are actually just zip files. I'll close this first. Um, I have this one. Um, so all of these Excel files are really just uh, zip files that themselves just contain a lot of XML files and other human readable uh, files. So it's really easy just to get started, just, you know, taking a look, poking around at the different files. Um, and the XML, uh, the, the format for these files is actually fairly well documented. So if you're looking for an open source project to get involved with, I really recommend uh, using OpenPy Excel uh, as well. Um, so yeah, the, the rest of, I don't want to go taking up too much more time, but there's a lot of other uh, features for Py, OpenPy Excel that I cover in uh, the book, Automate the Boring Stuff. And again, you can find this online uh, in full for free under a Creative Commons license at automatetheboringstuff.com. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I can take any questions that people have. All right, if you guys have questions, please come up here to the mic so that uh, Al can hear you, and we can give you guys an awesome answer. Actually, Jeff coming up for a question? All right, so we have one, someone's approaching the mic now as you speak, Al. Oh, okay. Hello, I was wondering if Pi, OpenPy Excel can handle uh, formulas in Excel. Uh, it can. Uh, right now, it can't. Um, uh, if you have a formula that uh, will evaluate to some data based on the other information in the Excel spreadsheet, OpenPy Excel won't be able to do that evaluation but you can store, uh, you can create your own formulas by just assigning it the exact same way you would in Excel. So I'll just go to one of these spreadsheets. Say if right here I wanted to add something like equals sum from C1 to uh, what, C7. And then it just shows this as the total of these cells right here. So OpenPy Excel, you won't be able to get this 466 number from it, but you will be able to create the formula just by assigning uh, this value to that, to that cells as that cells value. So I would have something like sheet C8 dot value would be equal to that. And then once you save this and when you open it up in Excel, you'd be able to, uh, it would, it would look exactly like this. So yeah, unfortunately you can't uh, be able to evaluate these, for these Excel formulas inside of OpenPy Excel yet. That's not a feature that they have. Hello, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a two part question. The first part is, um, does OpenPy Excel recognize the cell objects like the uh, Excel table? And then the second question is, uh, can you access the uh, underlying Excel data model that became available in Excel 2016 
via OpenPy itself? Um, so for the first part, uh, I believe you can't. Um, just uh, there are a lot of features uh, that OpenPy Excel has kind of like charts where you can create charts inside of new or existing sp uh, spreadsheets. But if your spreadsheet file had already has something like a chart or a table in it, then it when you load it inside of OpenPy Excel, it'll just completely not. Yeah, I guess that information just isn't parsed and returned in your workbook object. So tables, I believe, um, it doesn't have, you really just have access to sort of the primitive data types right here. Um, and uh, oh, what was your second question? Oh, there was a, there was a second part to the, oh. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I went to sit down to listen to uh, your response. Um, the second part, in uh, Excel 2016, I think it started in, in Excel 2013, um, Microsoft made available a data model that is actually like a uh, database type schema that's available in Excel that you can uh, use uh, uh, like Power Pivot and things like that to query against. Oh, okay. it's, uh, used, it's, it's highly compressed. It allows you to store a lot of data within a cell uh, that's highly compressible. I think it's uh, up to 10 times the uh, compression rate. So um, <clears throat> with that, that allows you to do a lot of things in the cell that traditionally you weren't able to do. Right, yeah, currently OpenPy Excel doesn't, uh, doesn't support that. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of, a lot of things um, a lot of really advanced features of Excel. So if you're really into Excel uh, that OpenPy Excel doesn't have yet, um, really what OpenPy Excel is, is really great at is just being able to read in uh, basic data types and also just generate uh, Excel spreadsheet files. But unfortunately, it doesn't support that feature yet. Are you familiar with uh, PISL? It's a tool developed by, uh, I believe, uh, uh, Nthought. Um, I think I've heard of it before, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm really familiar with it. Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. Hi, um, does OpenPy Excel have an SQL interface where you can write an SQL query and have it return a data set? Unfortunately, no. Uh, it's, it's sort of like you, something you treat like as a dictionary uh, where these individual cell uh, locations are sort of the keys and the data inside that cell is the value. So it's, uh, right now it's sort of just at the very primitive level of, of sort of a key value pair uh, store. How familiar or how friendly is OpenPy Excel with multi-user aspects of Excel such that two people could be in a spreadsheet at the same time? Oh, uh, currently it doesn't support that. Um, uh, it's it's sort of just treating the spreadsheet file as an individual, sort of like any other flat file that you just open and load in and then save any changes to. So right now there's nothing that you can sort of, you can't really make a connection to a spreadsheet file uh, that other people would be manipulating at the same time. Yeah, I got a question too. Are there any constraints around the size of Excel spreadsheet you can make? I mean, does it slow down considerably once you get past a certain number of rows or columns? Um, I don't believe so. I mean, I've done some testing uh, in this regard and I've been able to create spreadsheets with, I believe like something on the order of like tens of thousands of rows uh, with, you know, several columns of data. Uh, but as far as going, you know, sort of into the gigabyte range of that, uh, I haven't really um, uh, worked with with spreadsheet files that size. Um, theoretically, it's, it's something that I think OpenPy Excel should be able to handle. Um, I mean, I've never noticed at any sort of slowdowns at any size before, but uh, I haven't really tested sort of beyond, you know, tens of, on the order of magnitude of tens of thousands. That's probably good enough for my, my use cases. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? I got one more question coming up here. Or, oh, sure. Oh, okay, we've got, we got a couple more questions, Al. Okay. Uh, yeah, so for a lot of the people, or there's a couple of people here who are here specifically for the Excel aspect, and I was curious to maybe some um, practical, uh, pr practical examples of uh, maybe people you've spoken to uh, that really leverage this to make their lives better. I mean, obviously in the book, so, you know, read the book online, um, but 
anything specific that stands out to you that you'd like to share about that? Uh, yeah, actually, um, sort of before I, I wrote this book and it was just an idea in my head, uh, I went to a, a Python meetup here in San Francisco and I was talking with one person who, who wasn't a software developer. They had just taught themselves a little bit of Python and part of their job was to, I think, go to like the Yahoo Finance page and copy a whole bunch of numbers from there plug them into Excel and they had to do this every day to generate a report for their boss. Um, and he wasn't using Py uh, Excel at the time. I think he was just using uh, uh, CSV files, um, but he had taught himself enough programming to be able to generate these files uh, instantaneously. You know, just the script would do some web scraping, grab those numbers, put them inside of a, an Excel spreadsheet and then he could just email that off to his boss. And he's, he's just sort of, you know, took something that would usually eat up about 45 minutes or an hour of his day every day. And, you know, it took him several hours to be able to learn enough to write this script, but he would then be able to uh, just sort of generate these files all the time. And so really, I, I think a lot of the types of programming that, um, you know, for non-software developers who want to learn how to code, though a lot of types of, tasks that they can automate are sort of pulling data from one source and then being able to put data into some other format or, or also while doing some cleanup of the data. So whether that data is on a website that you have to do some web scraping or if it's in a flat text file or if it's in a database that you want to make a connection to and then just do some cleaning of that data and then packaging up in some other, uh, into some other file such as an Excel spreadsheet uh, that's something that really helped them out. Um, there was also, you know, I'm not exactly, uh, I'm not a super proficient with Excel, but there was one test case that I had once come up with. I created an example of that here where, say I have some sort of spreadsheet right here, just shows, you know, produce sales. It has something really simple like what the price is of some uh, piece of produce and how many pounds were sold of that. And then it has a very simple formula right here. Um, I had one case where I had, you know, a spreadsheet sort of like this and I wanted to update the cost of, let's say, you know, you wanted to update the cost of potatoes here. You know, normally you can just do a simple find and replace for, you know, find wherever uh, 86 cents is in this file and then update it elsewhere. But uh, the file that I was working with was super huge and I couldn't be sure that potatoes were the only thing that were, you know, 86 cents in cost. And so I didn't want to inadvertently change the data of some other type of thing either. But I didn't really know if there was some way of being able to find like, okay, I want to find 0 0.86 and change all and do a find and replace on all of those cells. But I also want to only do that if the cell to the left of that says potatoes. Uh, and then I also had several other items that I wanted to update the cost of. Um, and so here is where if I could just, you know, I know how to do this in Python already, so I can just write a quick script to do it. Um, but I just needed to figure out a way of how I could open up an entire spreadsheet and just use it the same way I would use a dictionary or a list of lists or, or some other, you know, Pythonic data structure and then be able to save that. So that's sort of the, one of the tasks that I found that, you know, using something like OpenPy Excel to open it up uh, really helped me out just because otherwise I would have to just do a find and replace, but I would have to visually inspect each time to make sure I'm not changing. I'm only changing the things I want to change and nothing else. Um, so that's uh, sort of uh, one example that, that I have just from my own workings with, with writing, you know, quick Python scripts to, to modify spreadsheets. Hi, Al. Uh, this is Ryder Timberlake. I'm a big fan. Uh, I would love to dig deeper and to automate the boring stuff with Python in the future. I'm actually using your command loop from your text RPG tutorial. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in a friend's game of porting from adrift. Anyway, uh, the question I wanted to ask you, so do you do a lot of these automation things in your day to day? Do you automate a lot of your daily tasks? Uh, I do. Um, and really, you know, I never really thought of it as automating things, but it was sort of like, if there was ever a chance where I could write a small script to pull a bunch of data, or yeah. especially if I ever found myself where I'm doing something where I'm like highlighting some sentence and then copying and pasting it into a different thing, um, 
Yeah. You know, even if writing the script would take probably just as long as doing it by hand, uh, sort of the, I would free myself from such mental strain of just having to sit there and, you know, just <laughs> doing this mindless task that's really boring. Um, it was super helpful f for something like that. Um, I think the the other two, uh, the the main ones I do are also the two chapters that are really popular in in Automate, uh, and that is one is web scraping, where if I wanted to just pull information from a website, uh, or just say like follow a bunch of links and download images from each page, or or download files from different links, and then you know click on the next link uh, programmatically. And once that page loads up, then download that file and click the next link and download the next file. Um, that helped out a lot. And also the other chapter is the GUI automation chapter, where essentially you can write a script that can control the mouse and keyboard for you. Because a lot of times you'll, you'll run into situations where you have to deal with software that doesn't have a public API. And there is really no way to automate it. You know, something like, you know, Photoshop has uh, batch automated processing where you can s record a whole bunch of steps and then play them out on e every image inside of a file inside of a file but most software doesn't have anything like that but you know they do have a graphical user interface and so if you can just sort of uh, write a script that will just you know click here then click here then click here uh, type this out and then click submit and then just do that over and over again writing a script really saves you just a lot of hassle of just having to, you know, sit down and do this task for an hour or two at a time. Um, so it's really saved me, you know, a lot of time uh, in that aspect. Awesome. Uh, thank you. You're speaking to my follow-up question, which I'm just going to sort of mumble here because I don't want to take up, we, you know, we don't want to take up uh, much more of your time, I think. I'm, I'm glancing over at Calvin as I say that. Um, but uh, so what I wanted to ask was what the main most useful automation uh, that you've done for yourself uh, has been in terms of productivity. Would it be like GUI or? or uh, uh, I, th I think so. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the problems I have whenever I, I try to come up with examples of like, oh, I wrote a script to do this. It's, it's usually something where, you know, I'm writing a software tool that helps me write other software. So that's not really something that, you know, non engineer software engineers would really find useful. Um, but yeah, when it, when it comes to just sort of like the types of tasks that other people might use, um, I think probably GUI automation and web scraping were really big ones. Um, oh, let's see, actually, uh, so No Starch Press, which published Automate the Boring Stuff, uh, one of the employees there actually read through the book and uh, wrote a small script that would just go to Amazon's website and then for each one of their titles, just download a whole bunch of Amazon rank information. So they could then just create graphs over time of like how the ranks of their different titles were doing on Amazon on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, that's something that, you know, you can get an intern to do, but that's, you know, a really tedious to just open a web browser, copy and paste all that information. Um, so, yeah, it's learning to code in order to write these sort of one-off scripts is really helpful. Um, and it's, it's, at the same time, it's hard for me to come up with a particular examples because it's so custom to your own personal uh, workflow or how your organization is set up, or how you have your files organized. Um, because, you know, for most common tasks, there's commercial software already written. You know, if you want to put information into a spreadsheet, you have Excel. If you want to write up a document, you have all sorts of word processing software. Um, and there's, there's software for doing, like, mass renaming of files. Um, but, you know, if you had some particular uh, task that's really specific to your own thing, you're kind of left with either doing it by hand or, I don't know, maybe hiring a software developer, which is usually going to be really expensive and not really worth the money. But by just learning how to code, you know, not enough to become a software engineer at Google or Facebook or anything like that, but just being able to learn enough code to be able to write a quick script to automate some really otherwise brain dead task is, is pr a pretty valuable skill to have. Thank you very much. No, oh, thank you. So you said that OpenPy Excel was fairly uh, um, 
rudimentary in its Excel manipulation um, and couldn't do a lot of the advanced features. Have you played with uh, GUI automation at all to see if you, how much of that stuff you could automate? Uh, I have. Um, so there is uh, one product called, uh, I believe, Sakuli, um, which is its own sort of uh, piece of software. It has its own editor and creates its own language. Um, a lot of people seem to really like that. On Windows, there's something called uh, uh, Auto Hotkey, which again, uh, creates its own scripting language and uh, is kind of nice to work with, but these are both sort of weird because they sort of, um, I don't know, for one, you have to sort of learn the, those systems. And I was re looking for something really, uh, I don't know, straightforward. I actually ended up writing a new uh, module called uh, Pi Auto uh, Pi Auto GUI, and let's see, that's in Chapter 18, right here. But essentially, Pi Auto GUI, I'll just load up the read the docs page for it. Uh, Pi Auto GUI uh, was different from all the other GUI automation modules for Python that I found because I wanted something that worked with Python 2 and 3, and also worked on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So uh, a lot of the tools that I found on Pi PI would just sort of be Windows only or Python 2 only or, or something like that. So um, I was able to sort of stand on the shoulders of giants um, by, by looking at their code and seeing how they did things. And I wanted to create a really dead simple a API. So uh, I think I might have it loaded here. Uh, so Pi Auto GUI, uh, I tried to make it a really sort of straightforward uh, API. So if you know, wanted to click the mouse somewhere, I can just pass it X, Y coordinates on your screen. And so you can see the mouse instantly has moved up here. Um, oh, I believe this version has, uh, if you enable user access control on Windows, you sometimes get errors, but it will still perform the action. Um, or it's something like Pyog GUI, uh, if you wanted to type out a string, then you can see it's instantly typed that out right here. That wasn't printed or returned from this function. Um, and so this was sort of another another really handy uh, thing that I, I developed. Um, and it actually, it actually became my most popular open source project that I've ever published. Uh, people really seem to, to respond well, well to this, just having something that was easy to use and fairly straightforward. Um, I mean, so theoretically you could use something like that if you just uh, had Excel open on, on your computer. And you could say like, oh, I wanna click here and then click on this and then click on this and then type in this uh, number right here. Um, there are some downsides with that. I gave a, a talk at DjangoCon and PyBay uh, more recently, uh, sort of covering what the PyAuto GUI module could do. And so you can check that out if you want. Is anybody else any questions? Oh, we got one more here. One more question, Al. Oh, okay. Hey, Al, I, I saw you at Pi Ohio, and I really enjoyed your talk about two years ago. And so I was just curious, are you, are you writing any more books? Is there anything new coming out from you? Or? Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so two years ago, I, I left my job to write books full time and, and finish up Automate. And then after that, I worked with No Stretch Press on a uh, book called Scratch Programming Playground. Um, there's a tool from MIT called Scratch, uh, which is sort of like a combination of the logo programming uh, thing where you have a turtle that you can you know, tell to move forward and turn right 90 degrees and it draws out sort of spirograph lines behind it and you can program it to do all sorts of neat little things. Um, Scratch is sort of like that plus several other things and it's a great programming tool for, for kids and beginners and so I have a book uh, uh, coming out from No Starch Press, uh, actually in a couple weeks, it's been under development and now it's uh, finally coming out. And uh, I had other book ideas. Uh, I really welcome any sort of ad advice on this. Um, one idea was sort of like writing in-house tools uh, in Python, sort of extending what Automate would do instead of, you know, instead of writing small scripts, uh, just writing small applications that, you know, again, you, if there's off the shelf commercial software for that's great, but if you want something very particular to your organization or your personal workflow, um, you know, just enough programming to be able to write something like that. Um, oh, and then the, the, the main book idea I had is 
uh, automating these robots in Minecraft. There's a Minecraft mod that uh, adds these sort of little robots that you can program in Lua, unfortunately, not Python. But you can actually just write a small Lua script that will program them to move around the Minecraft world. And I saw like, oh, this is great because so many, so many kids I know and probably a lot of adults too just absolutely love Minecraft. And so that was sort of another book up project idea. But yeah, um, everybody can can contact me. Probably Twitter is um, the best way to contact me. So I'm just at Al Swigert. Um, uh, my name right there, um, or just sending me an email at uh, al at inventwithpython.com. Uh, but yeah, I'm open to any more questions if anybody else has them. Yeah, we got one more. Um, I wanted to start off by saying uh, I absolutely love uh, PyAuto GUI. Um, it would have actually really helped out a lot a while ago when I was working on a project where I had to basically take uh, it's fairly simple and practical, like you would think, which would be to take um, rows out of an Excel spreadsheet and enter them into a form on a FileMaker Pro uh, database. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone doesn't know, FileMaker Pro databases can get like horribly convoluted if people don't build them well. Um, yes. So doing it programmatically could be rather difficult, but um, unfortunately, I wasn't aware of Pi Auto GUI at the time, so it. If, um, say, I had the spreadsheet, I could just uh, take the data out of that and then have it type it into the cells. Um, right, exactly. Since uh, PyAuto GUI will actually take a uh, snapshot, if you provide it with a PNG image, it can uh, find that on the screen for you. Um, I've been using, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it right now. There's a good uh, open source like screenshot tool that I was using for that. But um, are you, um, uh, so if, say, somebody wanted to fork PyAuto GUI uh, to kind of extend it a little bit more to make um, kind of managing all the snapshots and stuff easier, uh, is that uh, something you're open to? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I have PyAuto GUI available on GitHub. Um, you can just type up. I'm just Al Swigert on, oh, actually, no, I'm A Swigert on GitHub. Um, and so you can find the, the PyAuto GUI repo right there. Uh, I'm also accepting uh, pull requests uh, all the time. I don't have a lot of time to devote uh, to PyAuto GUI, but I try to stay up on uh, at least, you know, acknowledging all the bug reports that I get. Um, you can imagine there's all sorts of weird issues um, that, you know, being available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, having PyAuto GUI run on, you know, I had one person say like, oh, this doesn't work with my French keyboard. And so, you know, sort of situations I never really considered or ran into myself, but yeah. Oh, and going back to, to what you were saying earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there's probably some way to like with FileMaker Pro be able to like con programmatically just convert data from an Excel spreadsheet to FileMaker Pro. But a lot of times it's often just easier to use some sort of GUI automation tool that just, you know, plugs in uh, number, uh, all your data uh, by mimicking the keyboard and then just entering it that way. Um, yeah, so I can, I can definitely see that. There's also sort of, I think a lot of people tell me whenever they have to deal with sort of enterprise software, uh, those notoriously have atrocious user interfaces one guy I was talking to said like every day when he logs into his system at work, there is some like list of domains that he, uh, that, you know, if you want to access, he has to check these. And so there's 20 check boxes that he has to just check every day. And, you know, it takes 30 seconds to do this, but it's, it got to the point where he was so sick of doing that all the time. He just wrote a, a small script that would then just find the check boxes and do all that checking for him. So all he has to do is just run this uh, script and have it, do that small little task for him. Again, it's something really particular to his own setup that, you know, you'll never find some commercial software from Microsoft, you know, like checkbox clicker 2.0 or something like that. So being able to write your own code um, to do, you know, automate these little tasks like this is really helpful. Well, thank you very much.
Oh yeah, thank you. Oh, um, actually, if you would allow me to give you the 30 second version of a five minute lightning talk that I gave at Pi Bay, um, these Python meetups are really great. Um, uh, so I, I gave a talk at a uh, lightning talk at Pi Bay, uh, where I basically said, you know, all of these presentations, you can learn a lot from them, but for the most part, you can just sort of ditch all of these presentations. The most important thing about coming to a meetup, um, like these Python meetups, is meeting other people. So even if that involves, you know, just skipping out on the presentation, it's fine. They're all recorded and you can look them up online if you ever want that information. But go ahead and be sure to go out and, you know, say hello to the other humans that are in this room. Uh, exchange business cards, uh, get email addresses, follow up with them. Uh, it's a really wonderful opportunity that you don't want to miss. Uh, and be sure to come back to these Python meetups and just, you know, say hi and maintain those connections. But um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. It was great pre uh, presenting here. All right, Al, I could not agree more. Why don't you give Al a big round of applause and thank you so much for uh, joining us here in Indianapolis from the West Coast. <laughs>